Welcome to Data Science Perspectives. This series focuses on analytics and data science professionals from across industry to learn about how their career unfolded, what skills they look for when hiring, and what trends they think are coming next. I'm your host, Bill Franks. Let's get to it. Welcome to this episode of Data Science Perspectives. I'm your host, Bill Franks. Today, we're lucky to have Peter Maynard joining us. Peter's another longtime Atlanta person who just recently moved back to Virginia. He and I first got to know each other when we both served together on the advisory board for the Kennesaw State Analytics and Data Science programs. He's super smart and a really nice guy, as I'm sure you'll see today. After a couple of short initial jobs, he originally landed at Capital One, the credit card company. For those of you who aren't familiar, Capital One was one of the earliest adopters of many of the modern analytical and credit practices that permeate the industry today and was a real pioneer in this space. Over a period of 11 years, Peter held various roles uh, in different areas of the business, including collections, operations, risk, and decision sciences. He then moved over to Equifax, where he's been the past eight years in a number of SVP roles tied to various parts of the Equifax business and obviously focusing, all, as always, on data and analytics. He's got a bachelor's degree in economics from the University of Rhode Island and both a master's and PhD in economics from the University of Tennessee. And with that, let's welcome Peter to the show. Well, hey, Peter, thanks for joining me on the show today. Excellent, Bill. Great to talk to you. You know, I always like to dig in a little bit to how people got into the world of analytics and data science to begin with. And you you uh, came in actually from the world of economics. You've got your bachelor's, master and PhD in economics. So what brought you over into the, the world of, uh, of analytics from uh, those degree and uh, academic backgrounds? Yeah, sure. So I actually started um, when I was in graduate school. I, I was a teaching ass assistant uh, at University of Tennessee. And then uh, for a semester, I got a research assistantship. And uh, I got to work at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, actually estimating waste remediation for underground storage tank removal. And they needed someone to do some simulations and then cost estimations around what it would take and uh, that sort of work. And it was, it was awesome to work with a team. So there was a team of environmentalists, a uh, team of engineers, uh, and I was assigned to the staff uh, statistician to do some analytics. I just got completely energized by it. Um, and I, you know, while I loved the teaching part, I was like, I'd rather work on projects. And I love, I love the application of data and, you know, solving problems with data. And that's when that kind of spark jumped for me. And uh, I then started to do more research assistantships. And then by the time I graduated, uh, with my degree, um, I went to Virginia Commonwealth University and uh, as a research professor, which effectively means writes grants for food. Uh, and so uh, I did a lot of, you know, what's called outcomes research at the time. So I was their staff economist working on health outcomes and, and the like. So very much applied of how to, how to do a lot of uh, data analysis, statistical analysis. Um, to uh, various problems. And so I, I just got, caught the bug in graduate school. Yeah, and I know you, you've actually spent the bulk of your career in the financial services and, and uh, credit industry. So what initially drew you to that? And then even more importantly, what's kept you there for all these years? <laughs> um, yeah, so it was interesting. I, you know, when I, when I joined, uh, joined Capital One, it was fascinating to me because um, just how analytical the company was, right? I was like, oh my gosh, you know, in graduate school, there's, I don't know, maybe 15 of us. And then I remember during the interview at, at Capital One, um, the person who interviewed me, Dave Jepson, who's, who's now a healthcare executive out in Idaho, he, um, he said, well, you know, there's going to be, you know, there's going to be four times bigger than your graduate department. And you're going to have this like sea of professionals who are just going to stimulate you and, you know, guide you and, and help you in your career and, and challenge you. And that really was telling for me because, you know, to join a place like Capital One where working on really interesting problems uh, and then the ability to kind of dive into the data. And, and when I mean dive into the data, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting to see today, um, you know, people are, are working on, um, you know, NLP and, and you know, AI and, and kind of like, you know, picture recognition and they'll have 10,000 observations on these data sets. And that's how it was back when we started 
But when I went to graduate school, you know, if we had 10,000 observations a day, so that was like the world. But when I went to Capital One, we had millions of observations from three different credit bureaus. And that was just such an amazing challenge that I loved it. I loved the ability to kind of get in the data, you know, drive insights, drive the business. Um, I helped actually start our experimental design uh, at Equifax, I mean, at Capital One. So that was that was great just to take it, you know, just something that could really help the business and, and teach people a different way of actually gathering data. And we don't talk about gathering data as much sometimes and like creating data and gathering data is just as important as analyzing the data. So just to be a part of that sort of, sort of data value chain and getting hooked on it. Um, and then working for a company that really appreciated the, the power of analytics, uh, statistics, data science. Um, and that, that was really invigorating. People wanted us to come up with insights and to come up with new methodologies in new ways of, of uh, building models and new ways of creating features and attributes. So it was very exciting. You know, it's interesting for, for people who don't know, who might be watching or listening here, you know, Capital One's kind of legendary in the analytics industry in terms of it, it truly was one of the first data driven, you know, purely data driven businesses and, and Equifax where you are now, you know, very similarly. So you've been in that in the that industry from really the early days when it was still, to your point, new to have millions of records and actually do analytics to today where things are even uh, you know, worlds more sophisticated than, than than they were. So, what have been some of the biggest changes in the industry that you've seen over the last couple of decades as you've worked there? Yeah, you know, obviously, um, to, I remember seeing uh, the first presentation on kind of the the Hadoop file structure, and just moving to that, um, you know, that parallel processing, the ability of distributing processing, like that, that world, uh, I think was a pretty big change for us. Um, and, and that, that was 2007, 2008 was when I first became acclimated to it. I was like, Oh, this is, this is interesting. Right. Uh, now it took several years for companies to kind of get there. Um, but that was something that was definitely, um, you know, huge for, for a lot of industries. I think the other thing that was big was, um, the, the rise of the algorithms and other folks have talked about this, but we saw it at Equifax in 2014 and 2015, where we could see that, um, you know, with, with the changes and maybe this is the change is the movement away from kind of standard statistical packages and software to the open source um, and just the availability of, of so many more algorithms out there. And the ability to actually process them and actually use them in production, right? That's the big thing. I'd say that has been a really big change for us in our industry. Um, and so that led to the rise of the algorithm where these algorithms we, we kind of had, but they, the performance that we were able to get just, you know, was, was remarkable. And we're like, oh, wow. Because we previously it would be like, hey, if you had an extra hour of time, you spend on the data. Like, go get, go get more data, go clean your data, and you will get better, you know, better lift in your models. Then it became it switched to say, go find more algorithms, spend your hour on finding more algorithms because we can actually use them and now we can actually put them in production. And so that that started to to really move things about 2014, 2015, at least in, within Equifax. So I think that's been a big, a big change. And then now, you know, I see that, you know, changes in, in how data gets used, privacy changes, regulatory changes. I think those are going to be things that we're going to at least in my industry that we're paying a lot of attention to and, and are going to change how, how data gets used. Um, but, you know, I think for, for a lot of folks, um, you know, there's going to be more algorithms, there's going to be more data sources. Um, I think the big thing is, is the ability to integrate that into production. So it's not just an analytical toolbox, but it's actually a, um, you know, can actually be used to make better decisions. Right. And so I think that's going to be really, I think that's going to be a focal point for us going forward is how do we continue to to get that speed to insight, speed to action, speed to delivery, speed to, you know, uh, speed, speed, speed. I think that's really where we're going to continue to focus. You know, you hit on the regulatory issue. I know, you know, your industry is obviously heavily regulated. And for example, you have to be able to explain a credit model and, you know, exactly what went into that credit score and the, any decision made mm -hmm. off of that. So how how has this impacted the industry's ability in general to embrace some of the newest methods, right? As AI and other things have, have come along, are you finding uh, ways to work with the government to get those approved from a regulatory perspective? Or 
or, or is this still a, 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 a case where you have to stick to some of the older methods that have already been approved? Yeah, it's a, it's a great, it's a great question. Um, so within Equifax, um, starting in 2015, we actually, uh, developed the first, um, regulatory compliant, uh, machine learning credit model. And so what we did is, you know, we had a team of, of data scientists that, um, uh, you know, challenge the kind of the paradigm of like, well, a neural net's a black box. Like we can't understand it. We don't know what's going on. They actually said, no, it's, it's only math. We can figure it out. There's actually a guy named Matt Turner on my team who, who, you know, PhD from in mathematics from Tennessee is like, look, it's, it's math. We'll figure it out. And then we'll figure out how we can constrain the algorithm to be regulatory compliant. Cause the issue with, with, with the credit scores is that you have to have uh, features that all move, or that, that have to be fully explainable to the consumer. So, you can't have what's called a proxy model. I can't have a, a, a logistic model explain a, a random forest or a neural net. I have to actually, the mathematical object that's used to decision the consumer has to be the one to provide the reason for why the consumer um, got, the, got the loan or did not get the loan, right? And so you have to provide these four reason codes. So these reason codes are ranked by, you know, their importance in the model. So you have to know exactly like what's driving the model. Like you can't be like, well, here's your score and that's it. You have to say, okay, you know, age of oldest trade or your money utilization is too high or you're, um, you have too much revolving debt, right? Those sort of factors have to um, be clear and understood. And so, you know, we, we had to ex you know, explain that and we had to share that. We had to develop an algorithm that we can understand, you know, fully what was driving the model. And since then, we've extended it beyond neural nets to grain boosting and random forest. And the like, but but those sort of things, you know, we've we've socialized and explained to the CFPB, the OCC, Federal Reserve, and CUA. So we've done a lot of guiding them to say, hey, this is how you can use these models. And you know, there's models, you know, there, there's some other explainability methodologies uh, like Shop, um, which is which is great, um, but ours are fully interpretable, right? It's the the attribute is in the model, and we know the 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 magnitude, and we know the the sign of it, which is really, really important. So I think in our industry, you know, I think it's really important that we listen to the criticisms that people have around these things, right? And, and guide them and educate them on what's, what's, what's happening. It, it's, it's incumbent on us to, um, to make sure people really understand what's in the middle of, of these models, right? People want to know that they're human beings that are making these decisions, not that it's a robot or machine that's making these decisions. And it's human beings that code these things, right? And design them. So it's incumbent on us to explain how the machinery works, right? So um, I, I think that's you know going to be very important for us as we go forward. Actually, it sounds like some interesting work too. I'm sure the team, you know, back to how do you, how do you keep and retain employees and in a competitive marketplace, being able to give them the opportunity to figure out how to reverse engineer the, guts of some of these models in a, in a way that gets regulatory approval would be a, that'd be a pretty challenging and exciting uh, process to work on. Um, what do you think as you look back across your career and, and all these various things you've talked about, what's, what's a trait that you have that you think has most enabled you to be successful over the years? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I think, curiosity around solving, um, solving the problem, curiosity around solving, um, solving the problem. Gosh, that really seems difficult, but I don't know if it's crazy or <laughs> what, what's the you know, trade of, I think I can attack this. I think there's a way to begin chipping at this. Right. So I think I, you know, even when it started with my dissertation, like I, I didn't choose a traditional topic at the time. I chose a difficult topic because it was interesting to me. It was an interesting problem to solve. And so I think that's really important is not to shy away from the, the tough stuff and to actually work with others to, to figure it out. And the other thing is to work with others. I think that is the number one thing. Like if, if you know, it, it, it's people see the same, a lot of the same things you see. And so how can you join forces, you know, multiple brains working on a, a, a difficult problem with different perspectives, the diversity of thought is so important. Um, because if, if you have people with different thoughts coming in and, and you know, having that sort of curiosity, that's when the magic happens. And so I, I, I think that's um, a big part of why what keeps me going is, you know, people will give me challenging problems or 
there's a challenging opportunity. So uh, it's an offer where I go, gosh, we could solve this problem for one of the clients. They don't know it yet. So let's, let's, let's prepare, let's prepare a proposal for them about how we can help them, you know? And so that's the sort of stuff that gets people energized and gets me energized. And well, you know, as you think back, all the, all the things you've learned uh, over the years, what's one thing that you wish someone had told you about how the real world works uh, when you, when you started working that you ended up having to learn the hard way? That's a great question. You know, for me, I think knowing more about technology, I think that that is, you know, if there's, it's funny because, you know, a couple of my children are are now venturing into the the data science world. And so um, I, I really think that understanding the mindset of technologists, like, and, and that's, you know, that's why I actually love the PhD program at KSU. You all equip people with the framework of a technologist mindset, kind of software developer mindset, a business leader's mindset, and then a data science mindset. You guys do a really good job of that. And I think it's really important for, you know, I wish I paid a lot more attention to how, you know, how software development happens and taking a couple of those courses. So I think that for me has probably been a blind spot. Just go, gosh, you know, the world of technology is so important in our in our space. It's not just about the algorithms. It's not just about the data. Um, that's something I, I wish you know. I, I wish I could have spent a little bit more time on. You know, you you mentioned KSU, and uh, you know, you were one of the original sponsors of the ongoing what we call a research lab, but a research partnership uh, that Equifax has with KSU. It's been now going for multiple years, multiple patents, a lot of papers. What originally drew you to uh, form a partnership like that? And what do you see as the benefits to a, a large organization like Equifax of working with a local university to, to support some of the very initiatives that we've been talking about today? Yeah, um, so I think it's, I think it's important for uh, business, you know, businesses, local businesses, uh, especially to give back to the communities um, in which they, they reside. And I, I think working with universities is a way of doing that. Um, I also think that, um, you know, people in our profession are continually learning, right? And it enables people at Equifax to learn from you all, right? They may not see it as learning sometimes, but it, it is, right? It's it's learning as well and understanding kind of the, the new students and kind of what, what, what they're up to, what your research agenda is up to. So I think there's, you know, the, the business benefits for Equifax. I think, but what was really important about KSU is that, um, you know, one being one of the first data science um, programs in in the company at the PhD level, you all had a strategy and a vision that was really compelling. And and Jennifer Priestley did a fantastic job of laying that out. And so I I think that's, that's something that um, drew me in like, oh, wow, they, they, they understand the power of this discipline and that it's not just a, fly by night thing like this is kind of a way of being in in organizations right like that you need to be training people to be you know like your role bill your former role at teradata chief data and analytic officer like that's a real thing that has to be cultivated created nurtured at the at an academic level and so if we could be a part of that that would be great right so i think that was that was something that we saw as is really powerful um you know, and then the ability for, for students to work with professionals in the discipline and just begin to open those doors, both professionally in terms of, hey, you could potentially work here, but more of like, hey, here's the sort of problems that you can solve. Because, you know, if you think about it, their job is to begin to, to, to get, you know, advice I give folks is like, go take as many classes as you can, right? Go take, like, you, you may not think you need, you know, a class over in, in software engineering because it's not, it may not be a, a requisite, but it could be a good professor and that who has a great reputation and she's like, will challenge you, like, go take that class, right? Go maximize your learning that you can do, you know? So I think it's really important that, you know, you, you just guide the students in terms of business problem to skill set to what's in their toolkit. Like, how do you kind of help them kind of package that, bring that all together? And so, um, you know, I think it's, I, I just think universities are, you know, there's a, I don't know what the multiplier is on universities and the communities, but it's got to be high, right? In terms of the ability to to keep people energized, create jobs, it's 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 so important. 
So you, you were just talking about the university partnerships and, and students and giving them the opportunity to work on real problems. You know, you've hired a lot of people over the years. What are some of the, the key things that uh, you look for when you're hiring someone today? Yeah. So the, the first thing is, you know, how many, you know, what, what are the sort of challenges they've, they've enrolled themselves in, right? Like what are, what are the sort of work that they've looked to do? How has that, you know, move their business materially, like looking at it from a results perspective um, and, and their ability to actually explain, explain their work. You know, it, it's, um, it's such an important trait in, in data science um, to actually, you know, it, let's say they were not in financial services and they're in healthcare and I'm interviewing them. If they're, you know, if they can't explain to me, even though I'm, you know, I'm not in their industry, exactly what they did, what the problem is that they're trying to solve, the methodology they use, uh, what barriers they overcome. And if they're not really crisp and kind of articulating that, um, because it's about them, right? It's their lives that they should be pretty pretty good at being able to explain kind of how they did that and how they approached it. Um, then then their ability to communicate with others is going to be challenging, right? That's so important. It's communication is a, a huge skill because you know, the whole forest and the tree falling in the forest, if you can't hear the tree, what, what sort of happens, you know? And, and so I feel within our, 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 you know, within our role, it's so important that you have the, the storytellers and the leaders need to be storytellers. So, I'm, you know, I'm hiring at leadership levels now. And so that, that's, that's really big um, is, is being able to do that. I think the other thing is, do they know how to put together a strategy? I think a strategy is um, such an important exercise. A strategy is a declaration of where where you're going to take the business, and then what it's going to take to get there, right? And and strategy, you know, people can say, well, there's big S strategy, you know, Equifax is a corporate strategy, but every functional area should have a strategy, right? And so, how have data science leaders? How have they planned to make their area, their function, better than it is today, right? What are, what are they doing? How are they, you know, how are they championing their people? How are they training their people? How are they bringing in new technology, um, new ways of doing things? How are they challenging the processes within their organizations, right? And making those offers like, hey, we could help a new business line by doing these sort of models, right? Or getting this sort of data. So I think building that sort of strategy is, is so important, having those sort of skills to build those strategies. So those are the things that I look for, you know, at, at leadership levels, because you need someone to have, at all levels, they have to have a vision. And if he's, you need someone to have at all levels, they have to have a vision. And if you, you know, every new idea coming along seems like a great idea. And then that's when you get to people like getting off track, both from a career perspective, but from a business perspective. But if you all get everyone to agree, like, no, this is what we're about. And we're all going to work towards getting there and looking for ideas and how to get there. Now, not everything's going to be a straight line, but I think that's really important that, that folks have an opinion about what success looks like, what their destination is, and then share it broadly. You have to share it with, your technical peers, you got to share it with your partners, you got to share it with your your internal customers, right? The people who are commissioning you to do work. So I think that's that's really important um, for folks. So I, I'm going to hazard a guess here that you, as well as anybody that reports to you, has a strategy that you've put in place and that you regularly <laughs> revisit. So how yeah. often do you have your team actually revisit and update those strategies? Is that a quarterly thing, a yearly thing? Like, like what pace? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So um, so we, we, my leadership team and I met yesterday to go over our 2022 goals, right? And so... Um, you know, there's two things that, that we're focused on as our imperatives right now. Um, and we, we outlined, uh, what those imperatives are. And then we said, you know, he, here's the sort of things that we're going to, what are we going to do to, 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 to get there? The strategy we laid out in June. So I, I started my new role in, in February. So I just kind of fresh off that process. And so. You know, I went through, created the strategy with the team in June, and then, you know, now updating on, you know, here are the two pieces where we need to, you know, differentially invest. Um, but I then what I did is earlier this week, I actually kicked off a process for my teams. So there's there's three teams that I have where they don't don't have a functional strategy yet, right? So 
Um, and so what I'm doing is I'm actually building out what are their functional strategies. So these are functions within my team that, hey, we haven't really revisited that. So yeah, there's an Uber strategy, but then within those, the, you know, to satisfy the larger strategy, hey, what are we doing in, the, in, these, in these areas? So, um, so to, always working on strategy is the answer, Bill. It, it, always clarifying destination, always clarifying for the sake of what, in terms of why we're doing things. Um, you know, and, and it's, it's important in the, the, the exercise that we're going to go through and what I'm, you know, I'm going to be training my managers on is, is how to, what informs your strategy, right? Like how do you get external, like what external voices do you need to listen to? What internal processes do you need to study? Who are industry experts that you, so that's the sort of process to, to really stimulate them about what's possible. The, the problem with organizations, and you know this, is like you can navel gaze, you just kind of focus on what's in front of you and you just kind of like go like, oh, we'll do this next. And it's like, whoa, there's a big, awesome world out there. And what what is, what's going on in that awesome world? And, and I remember when I was at Capital One, uh, there's a guy named Leonard Roseman. And we were thinking about like, hey, how do we build certain types of models? And he literally looked across to healthcare and he looked at how the FDA had just approved Bayesian methodologies for assessing, um, you know, F submissions in terms of, you know, should you go, should you uh, approve a drug or medical regimen or not? And he's like, well, this is, this analogy works perfectly for us and test and learn. Like at what point do you say, you know, do you have to have uh, 12, 24 months of data before you do champion challenger or can you, you apply a Bayesian updating method? So within three months you can choose between champion challenger. That for me was like, a huge aha strategically, like you need to get out of your zone. You need to get out of finance, like go look at what other people are doing. Now, my job as a leader is I need to create that space for them to go look, right? Cause there's other people who are, you gotta do this. You got like, okay, yeah, got it. But like my job is to coil the springs for the company year two, year three, year four. And so that's so important that I, you know, that I set that time for them to think. Um, and they do, but they, they need to think too. Like, where do we need to go? What are other people doing? Just kind of, you know, listening to your podcast, like what are things, what are people up to? And being curious that way is so important. And I, I just feel like personally, I don't get enough time to do it. And I think, you know, we're so busy, like you gotta, you, you gotta strategy makes you make that time to do it. So you can tell I'm a little passionate about the topic. Yeah. I was going <laughs> to say, you know, we're, we're, we're running out of time here. That was a great way to finish though, with some, with some really good insights into both your, you know, your management style, but also your philosophy behind it. So, you know, I want to thank you for joining me today and taking time out of your busy day. And, um, you know, I look forward to continuing these conversations moving forward.